It's June the 24th, 2015. I'm Dana Durnford, also known as nuclearproctologist.org, and you can find these videos and Fukushima presentations at Beautiful Girl by Dana on YouTube. First an intro. heading out on the expedition for life to document the radioactive fallout from Japan's melted reactors. This is one of the models you're looking at below but it only included two elements. There was a recent revelation that came out I should say today that there was a million becquels per square meter per square meter flowing over North America. Let's just run over for a quick look at that before I come over and say hi to everybody in the chat room. And just because a lot of people don't understand these live streams, so it's better to open up for one minute and then come over and say hi so everybody gets a chance to, to understand that this is a live stream. And when we do that, we like to say hi to everybody. But uh, Fukushima Plume, we're going to cover this more in a second. Fukushima Plume model showed one million Beckwells, one million dead man walking over the West Coast. So your children, they stand up in a one meter, square meter area. Uh, now... 25 years ago, a nuclear plant worker was only allowed to get five Beckwells a year. Or they weren't allowed back at their job anymore. So what does one million Beckwells in a square meter throughout the entire country, and that, that went up into your upper troposphere and lower troposphere, and just a single plume would take 10 years to rain out. How much would a million Beckwells per square meter plume take to rain out and take to disappear? Uh, nobody will be alive to know because this is going to wipe out this entire planet. Everything. There's nothing on the planet that has ever encountered radiation before. I know a lot of people are going to yell at me because they see me with a cigarette in my hand. I'm smoking true Canadian classic with up to 7,000 chemicals. I do got a filter and I cold Dana, but I don't got the 7,000 chemicals. So, let me come over and say hi to everybody. And let me jump back over to that dispersal model. I want you to think about, instead of two radioactive elements, a million becquels a square meter with thousands of radioactive atoms, different types of atoms. And so, I'm not even checking to see if I'm streaming. Dan is slack. Got a filter, not cold. Okay. And so, I have a few puffs off that. Hi, Jester. Ellie. Kate. In case you've got the Fukushima Hounds down below, you'll find a link. Guy Hills, that's an independent site. And Kate is running a site with a, just an incredible bunch of lovely people that truly care about you and the planet and the animals and the environment in more ways than I can ever articulate. And that's why they exist. Hi, Shani Ken. Elaine. And LA Guy. Get my bearings back again. Jester, Miss Milky. Miss Milky got a wicked video up there. She just put up. I only, only caught about 20, 25 minutes of it, but really intriguing video. She just put up on her site. You'll find the links below. Missing Sky, you'll find uh, Missing Sky's links below too, folks. Hi, Adam. Want to be live 24? We're almost through, everybody. Adam Salini and Adam... Thank you, my friend, for all your kind words all the time. Toxic! And I'll just run in and say hi to everybody here. And so there's a lot of people that don't talk in a conversation. That doesn't mean they're not out there. Jamie. Um, Kitty. Ain't Jester. Patrick. And so the Expedition for Life, you were just looking at a little tiny intro of it a few moments ago. And what was the point I'm going to make here? See, a million Beckwells a square meter. I just caught that headline before I went live. So we're seeing them elude now, finally. Finally. 
Now, but I mean, if you think about those headlines, and I'll talk about the Expedition for Life in a second here for everybody, this is where we crowdfunded an operation to go out and look for life along the coastline of British Columbia. We'll come to that headline here in a second. Took us some pictures for you and a little video coming up. I already played a little video for you. And I digressed. Let me see. So there's a picture of the Expedition for Life. That's the operation. It's a 24-foot Coast Guard Zodiac with a bulletproof bottom, a Kevlar bottom. It's got a welded aluminum cabin on it. It's got a Zodiac on the roof. And it's got the searchlights and the radars. It's got a daylight system. You can't see it right around the boat. It's got two motors on the back, a kicker. That has saved my life a couple of times. And the expedition for life itself is more important than me, trust me. And, and we got a highball operation. It's just a small operation, but it's very highball. And so we have cameras. And this is all crowdfunded, and everything you see there is paid for by people all around this planet. Now, we done a fundraiser. A um, week and a half ago, we raised $1,800, and another 100 trickle in. And Janet and Fred stepped up with 2400 Canadian. And so that bumped us right up there to 4200 I guess, 4300 And that money, I just spent uh, almost a 1000 of it. Because, you know, these expeditions, you still need stuff. The trailer was going to get me killed. The front leg snapped off. And if Terry wasn't there when that happened, I would have got taken apart by that trailer. And he, was, he managed to get a chunk of wood underneath it before we lost control of it. And so we got a new leg. And I'll put a little video up here coming up in a little tiny bit. That was 300 bucks I just spent. We had to put lights on the trailer because you got to. You got to have them on there. And we didn't have them. That's two sets we're after putting on now. We picked up two tripods. And those lights were around 100 uh, These chargers were $39 each. And they'll charge the camera's batteries because all the chargers were broken. I couldn't get the original charger, so I bought those chargers. And then the tripods. This one was 119 It's got a pistol grip on it. And that's the first time we had an expensive, a nice one. I call it a nice one, but... The ones, the nice ones were f almost 500 bucks. I didn't get those, obviously. And we got another one for $60. They're good, they're good tripods. They're not any special, but they're good tripods. And we lost the other ones over when we flipped over the Zodiac in the Charlotte a month and a half ago. And we done $6,000 worth of damage. And so this time, instead of using the $10 speakers, there's going to be a couple of us. I'm not sure if Terry's coming or not. He's tied up in a court case where he's going after a former employee for just really doing the job on him. And we, we put all that paperwork together. Now we actually got him, and today he admitted that. And so that's good news, but he might have to hang out for an extra week, so he might not get it to the next trip. Um, so this is just a wireless for on the beaches. It's, or it's a rechargeable entertainment unit. And because we got no entertainment whatsoever, and uh, it's just terrible when you, you know, you're only doing the low tides and then you're stuck on the beaches. But the good thing about that is you wake up and find yourself at work. And so all together, did I cover everything? All together, I'll play a little video coming up here. All together, you're looking at right there was $950. And I still got to buy just two, a couple of more items. I got to buy a couple of cots for on the beaches and a, and a tent for on the beach. I got to buy a big tent or two small tents. Two small tents most likely. And... I mean, my kid is going to be going after Simon, and Simon's 24, 25. And so he's going to come up for 10 days and give us a hand to get that data out. And while I'm talking, let me play the video, because I got it there. And so I'll play that in the background. That's me changing the leg, and so that'll give you some context. And that's me with my slippers on. Yeah, I got my slippers on. Dana, shouldn't you wear your steel toes, Dana? Shut up, Dana, get on with the video. <clears throat> I'm just waiting for it to show up over here for a start talking for a couple of minutes while this plays itself out. And so, um, 
And I'll go back to some more pictures after I'm doing the trailer lights. I can show you what kind of mess that was, what kind of nightmare that thing was. And so we got all that kinks out of that. And so the expedition for life, we're going to take the operation. We're going to go up to the north coast, there are 300 miles from here in the middle of nowhere. And we're going to stay on an archipelago of islands for 10 days, me and Simon. Hopefully Terry is going to be free to go with us. If not, he'll come the next trip. And so, we're going to get two low tides a day. And we're looking at temperatures around 32 degrees Celsius. And so 80, 85 degrees basically Fahrenheit temperatures. So we'll be doing an insect study. Um, like we'll be doing the low tides. We'll be doing the low tide zones. We'll be doing underwater footage. And of course, Simon's 25 years old, so he's already got a lot of work under his belt doing this now. So this this is our third trip, the third expedition. And so this one, I think everybody's got their acts together. And, you know, every trip you're going to have to pick up a couple of pieces for the trip. But now we've got a whole operation put together, a very high-end operation together. And we're looking at a $60,000, I guess, operation all together. The boats, the motors, the equipment, the cameras and everything else. And so it's not, it's not a small operation, it's a, it's a very high ball operation, meant to go out and come back each time, meant to always get the job done, meant to be easily repaired, and meant to always be ready on the drop of a hat to go. And so we are seeing an acceleration of deaths along the coastline of all the species. And we've already done eight months of expeditions along the coastline, we covered 8,000 miles of the coastline and just to make sure, keep an eye on the comment section. I actually, because that's the only way I can keep up with it. Is I got another computer that'll most likely crash, and it only crashes during the live streams. <clears throat> now I got a lot of work done on the boat. I never got it down to the welders today. I'm just burnt out. By the time I got everything done, I finished up at 11 o'clock this morning out there, and I, I just I ran out of steam today. It's the first day we had cloud cover since I got home. And so it's a, it cooled off. And so I, I went back to bed a little bit and tried to get some peace. And because we're, you know, I haven't stopped since I come home. We uploaded uh, thousands and thousands of pictures are ready to the expedition, from the expedition for life at the nuclear proctologist.org. <clears throat> and I'll let that video finish out here in the background. Just as a novelty of Dana doing something, because nobody ever sees me do anything. And you just see the results and the operation itself, which you, you never, you really actually see Dana being goofy out there. Because <laughs> you got to realize that I'm actually not very strong, you know. And the only strength I got is because when my wheelchair washed over the boat, you know, I was forced to deal with that because I couldn't get my hands on another wheelchair. And so I become quite mobile, uh, or, you know, after 160 days on the ocean. It would just mean the dog hitting the beaches and the coastline and the archipelagos and covering bird expeditions. Like, you folks are amazing that we've done this. Whether we win or not, whether we win, lose, or draw or not. The thing was, we, we, we gave them a go like they've never experienced. And most likely, uh, they're going to get you know have to learn to accept that experience because it's, it's, it's just, we're just researching. But because we're not controllable researchers where we're just sharing all the data with everybody in the raw formats they don't know what to do with you that's the one thing they don't do right they do a study they publish it and you can't get access to it else for Springer and Wiley um, you know every day every th every minute there's three academic studies published and locked away behind the paywalls of else for Springer and Wiley the three biggest publishing houses on the planet and so your institution produces a study, else for Springer and Wiley publishes, and they get the copyrights. They don't do nothing. Some other university done the peer review on it. Elsewhere didn't pay them. Elsewhere didn't pay for the study. But they charge you to go look at the study that you paid for. You paid for all that. And so 1,400, I think it is, or something. Don't quote me anymore. 30, or 4,300 studies. So it's 1,440 minutes in a day, three a minute. Over... Over uh, 44,000, 4,300 peer-reviewed studies published every day. 
So, like, just imagine if you were reading a ticker, ticker tape of 4,300 studies that were published today. You had a ticker tape, and you could rewind it, and when you got a chance every day, you can scroll through 4,300 peer-reviewed studies published in your in North America every day and see what was studied or what was developed or what they're, you know, what what's going on. But you can't do that. That's all locked away, right? But we're not. We're published up at the nuclearproctologist.org. And you can find these videos of Beautiful Girl by Dana on YouTube. And so they can't control that per se. Well, they can. They can control who can find the site. They can control who likes the site. They can control who subscribes, stays subscribed to the site. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have said, Dana, they unsubscribe from me. So if you see me subscribe again, I didn't unsubscribe. I was unsubscribed by Google. Your videos didn't show up, and when I checked, I had to subscribe again. And that's why Dana loves all these people so much. And so, is that video playing a second time? Dana, get back to the program, Dana. And so anyway, there you go, you know. I'll stop that for us right quick. Hang on. I'll put another graphic up there while I'm yakking. And so all these studies that are published are locked away. And so all I can basically do, if I'm lucky, is get my hands on the synopsis. And, you know, you, you would need a big bank account to go in and read these things. If you can even get access to it without certain credentials. A lot of it, you can't even get access to it. You paid for it. Elsewhere stole it, got the copyrights to it, and locked it away. And, do you, and you wonder why we got so many problems. You wonder why we can't find any solutions. Because the data is hid away. But they don't have any, any legal right to that. They manipulated everything. And for some reason, they steal all of these studies. So you can, all you hear about is Fox News talking about political stuff. All you hear is CNN talking about ideology stuff. All you hear is the mainstream uh, media telling you to, to, to respect the authorities and that they wouldn't lie to you. Meanwhile, they're, they're, they told you nuclear was like a banana for 70 years. These are the very same people the very same entities that have got us in all of these problems, your mainstream media. But when you get outside of that realm, that's when you actually start learning actual information. That's when you start hearing about pertinent and important uh, factual information concerning any topic. But if there's a story, a breaking story, if you go to mainstream media, you are going to be brainwashed and manipulated and deceived and you're going to be treated like a moron and an idiot. And you're going to be incapacitated and having a debate or a conversation. All you're going to be able to do is regurgitate whatever you were, you, you were fed. I don't do that with you. And so what you're looking at me, P.I. me, is just one of the models that got hit away. But the purple is all radiation. That purple is radiation over the entire northern hemisphere. And this stuff is much smaller than the air pollution like automobiles and forest fires that is coming across the ocean. Much, much smaller. Oodles and oodles and oodles. Oodles. Smaller. And let me see if I can find another picture for us. One more, there's one more picture I didn't cover. And so we got, we got over $3,000 left. I was hoping to raise another 2000 And I'm not complaining. You know, uh, because I still got to buy more stuff. I still got to buy this. I still got to buy that. These are all the wires I tore off. Uh, what a mess that was. That's the new wires. New equipment. There's an extra set of side lights. It's not in the picture. There's the old light I took off. There's a party one I put on. That's the wires not connected in there. But anyway, you have to trust me. I connected it. Got it all working. It's all bling blingy now, and there's light. I got lights mounted on the side right here, so for the side view, so people don't run into us through the intersection, go flying through. But I was trying to hope to get a good picture, but I don't. And so it's not a perfect fit. So me. And what else was there, Dana? Nothing. Okay, let me get rid of that. Let me come back over, and get busy. So. The expedition, well, all I'm doing is showing you is the expedition is getting ready to go back out. Heading back out. Going to head back out into the fray. And let's go look at some headlines from the Pacific Ocean. 
Who knows where I got everything anymore? Let's just run over and look at these headlines for something to do. So many fullers! Jetstream Ocean! Let's scroll down, down, Dana. Let's start in the middle for a change, Dana. Because you never know what I'm going to click on is the problem. I got so much stuff there, I can't even remember what's in each folder unless I'm at these folders all the time because I got so many of them. I probably got 400 different folders on different aspects of Fukushima. The largest, and I mean, a lot of these folders could have seven, eight, nine hundred headlines in it. The largest disease outbreak, unless I got them refined down to a, because I'm making that documentary. So I'm trying to, you can't put everything in the documentary, right? And so I have to organize the actual data, the information, and make sure it's vetted. The largest disease outbreak that we've ever known of in the ocean, now hitting the West Coast, June 16, 2014. Potential for global extinction. Let's click there, Dana, because that's what this, tonight's show is about. We are looking at an extinction event on this planet. And you say, oh, gee, Dana, you know, great. Just wonder bars. And um, you think you might be, like, exaggerating things, Dana? Well, Chernobyl lasted 10 days, and it's one-third the size of any of the reactors at Fukushima, and Fukushima's were three 100% meltdowns. Chernobyl was only a 30% meltdown, one-third meltdown. Now, Chernobyl was equal. It only lasted 10 days. Fukushima didn't stop. But, but Chernobyl stopped after 10 days, that chain reaction. And it was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. That, on its own, was catastrophic. You couldn't eat the reindeer in Lapia. You can't eat and drink the milk in certain parts of the UK, certain parts of Ireland, certain parts of Scotland 28 years later. But that radioactive releases was only 10 days long. But there was so much of it. See? But that was only one-third the size of any of the reactors at Fukushima. That was only a 30% meltdown compared to any of the reactors at Fukushima. That wasn't using mixed oxide fuel, which is two million times worse than any other reactor on the planet. Chernobyl wasn't. It was using graphite. Fukushima, the toxicity and the, and the madness of that fuel is around two billion times worse. The atoms... Right, because they already went through a chain reaction one time, they're two million times worse, had been put through a chain reaction again. That makes them two million times again, so two million times two million minimum. But because this was enriched, highly processed, our, and missile, you know, stuff they were using for detonation. You know, 99.9999999 nines percent pure, each aspect of it. And so when you compare Chernobyl, it was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Three million children permanent disabilities. Million dead uh, that we know about. That you can, that's a guarantee yet uh, because the radioactive fallout, the exclusion zones, the way it keeps migrating out, the constant releases coming out of there, the inability to contain it where they're trying to build another sarcophagus to put over it. You can't contain it. The gases will build up and it'll detonate. The noble gases will build up. TV like a horror show at the Los Angeles area beach. Unusual number of marine animals suddenly getting sick and dying. And I wonder if something in the water is killing them. They hobble and fall over. It's heartbreaking. It doesn't stop, see? That's the problem. Over 50 dead seals. Sea lions, whales, walruses. That's 2014. Let me show you 2015 headlines. Hang on. Mass die off of walruses and sea, sea birds and the whales. Now, I covered that in my last video. These were all krill eaters. Everything you see in there, the, the birds, the walruses are dependent upon the krill to feed the fish they're preying up on. Everything is dependent upon the krill. Krill is dependent upon the phytoplankton. The phytoplankton was the first thing to be, and we're all dependent upon, the, everything is dependent upon the phytoplankton, ultimately, because that's the basis of the food chain, the oxygen chain, and the carbon sequestering chain. And so something out of the ordinary is happening. And we're at a loss. Maybe whales ran into toxin. Well, what I showed in my video was this was happening right throughout the planet for... Uh, for the, those filter feeders, for those krill eaters, for those fin whales, for the baleen whales, for those type of species in particular, and the birds, I mean the oaklets, hundreds of thousands of them, they all, they're all krill eaters. 
the salmon, the, 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 fly, the salmon failing, uh, the migratory birds failing, they're all dependent upon the, the krill because they, they migratory with the krill, right? So they're like, you know, they, the animals and the birds and the mammals and the bait marine um, uh, fish and predators will migratory along with the krill to feed on the predators that are dependent upon the krill. The birds will go thousands of miles with the krill because they got food with them at all the time and they just meander along the coastlines and across the oceans with the krills because these blooms are so big. Right? You do see how that works. And then the tidal pools is for is the nursery. That's where all the babies of all the creatures are going to hang out. Except for whales, they're too big to get in the tidal pool. But anything that's having babies, and like an oyster would have 700,000 or 10 million babies. A lingcod would have 700,000 babies, but only a couple would survive. But these babies would live for long times in the tidal pool. There goes the computer. It's the weirdest stuff ever. <clears throat> I don't know, you know, I, I got all the updates done. It's a brand new computer. And so your tidal pools are naked. They're naked, and like I'll just show you some pictures of that, I suppose. Uh, where's this, Dana? This is the nuclear proctologist.org. This is my site, and you'll find each one of these is full of links of, of uh, headlines or pictures of the expedition. And at the bottom of it are the most recent ones, right? These are all I put up in the last couple of weeks, starting. Starting right here with the fire pit in the back window. My computer, fire up, buddy. And so if you want to look at pictures, this is Macaulay Island. Island and like you can see right away, these rocks are naked, right? So just click your picture once. Now you got to let these pages load up. Now these pictures are in particular, and you got to let the, the picture settle down, and you'll get a higher quality or format of seven ways for your devices. The pictures you're looking at now are just screen captures of the original pictures because I was on the expedition for life on the ocean for 160 days and I didn't have the bandwidth to put up those high quality and so I put up the lower quality just screen captures so people would have some context. And you can scroll through the pictures. You can see 600 algaes are missing. 600 kelps. So even if there was 10 kelps there, you wouldn't see that rock. What would it look like with 600 algaes on it? You could never get a shirt because you break your neck. Well, it's not hard to be shorter anywhere, is it? Let me scroll down through it now that you can see the color of the rock. So when I click on it, now I know it don't look like it's low tide because there's nothing on the rock, but you can see the color of the rock down below. And I can assure you that the tide is, it might not be quite low, but bloody well close to it. And so I also give you the GPSs of a lot of these spots. 53, 67, north. And west, 130.41.385 degrees. And just click right hand in the picture or left hand to go back. You don't have to use the arrows, but you know if you like using arrows, go ahead and use the arrows. And you can see the rocks everywhere are naked. So I'm, I'm right there, I'm heading out to a big rock pile offshore. When you see those colors, uh, there's, there's no trees usually on those, but there, I think that one is... There's a lighthouse on it or something. That was that little island you see. Hang on. That's another picture. Yeah, that's that rocks. There's a bunch of rocks there on that map. I'll show you. See that map? See that light green? Well, what that means is there's no trees on it. But you see the ones over here with the, with the green? They got trees on them. So what I'm trying to say to you is that rock is almost underwater at low tide. Or it is underwater at low tide. You know, and, but it would break with the waves hitting it at low tide because it's just under at high tide, rather. And at low tide, the rock is exposed like you're seeing now. And then you've seen some of those pictures. There's nothing there on that rock. Right? There's a couple of algae on that rock out there by itself in particular. Look at that. See? But not many. There's not 600. And there's some barnacles, but that's it. And... That's some of the other rocks that was in that map you were looking at. They were still underwater. And so they would take the leg off your boat if you're cruising too fast and the water was a little bit higher. On a calm day, you wouldn't see it. And so now I'm moving up to that island with the green on it. So you'll see trees on the island. And you can see me coming into the island. And you can see now, you can see there, there, there's very little 
if anything left whatsoever on those rocks. And so that's an extinction event because what that means, what that's translating to, what, what that's telling anybody that knows about the ecosystem is that the nursery doesn't exist here anymore. It's gone. The, the 600 algaes where everything can live in harmony, where the 6,500 invertebrates without the backbones, like the little krills and the little shrimp, they look like krill. A krill looks like a shrimp. And that's the easiest way to explain it. There's 6,500 different ones with different appendages that, and different types of uh, characteristics. So they're individual species, and that's been categorized by the major institutions that are considered residential to the coastline of British Columbia, where I'm too, where the expedition for life just went through uh, 800, 8,000 uh, mile extended uh, tour looking for life, looking at the damage, look, counting the birds. And we see a total apocalyptic of the 169 species of residential or migratory and 148 residential birds. We counted less than uh, 11 species, and the only healthy species. It, if you were considered healthy because there was more than the other species, was the comorants, and they're deep divers, they eat big fish. And so fish are further up the food chain compared to what, everything that's in the tidal pool. And the tidal pool was exposed. And the tidal pool, everything that washes through the mountains, has to run over the tidal pools to get back into the ocean. Right? Everything on the west side of the Rocky Mountains washes towards the Pacific Ocean. Everything on the east side of the Rocky Mountains go towards the Atlantic and the Gulf, right? I gotta start up my computer. It'll probably crash on me again. Brand new. It doesn't do that for anything. Only the live stream. And I got a little tiny screen there, and I'm, I'm I'm reading the comments. But I've been out watching other live streams and other stuff with that computer. It never crashes. But during this live stream, because I'm moderating the conversation and other things that I don't talk about, because otherwise. What's the point if they know what I'm up to? <laughs> you don't want to tell them what you're up to too much. How you figuring out what they're up to. But I have to monitor a number of things on this planet. And, you know, that's... I'm going to digress here. Keep going. So they call it a mystery. So when Ebola broke out, what they do? They got out their gear and they showed you a picture of what the Ebola looked out. When the avian flu, the bird flu started mutating, every time it mutated, they got, they got their laboratories and they showed you a picture of that virus, that mystery. There's never a mystery pathogen, never a mystery virus because they just went and got a picture of it. But when it comes to the Pacific Ocean, there's always a mystery virus, a mysterious pathogen. How come? Because if, if they start showing pictures, other people out there will go looking for the pictures in their area. And then all of a sudden, the, the bag, the cat is out of the bag, or the, the extinction le level event is out of the bag. Birds falling for a sky, because uh, there's so much radiation. And so, toxin hit records levels of thousands of percent above the government limits. The government just keeps raising the limit. So your government now is officially gone rogue on you. It's officially turned its back on you. It's officially thrown you away. It's officially abandoned you, and it's a, it's it's cannibalizing your pensions and your assets and your infrastructure, to, so they can have money for the coming uh, panic, the covering, the coming uh, nightmare that's coming our way. Heart lesions. Now, your heart, uh, cesium in particular, which is one of the byproducts uh, at the thousands of the chain reaction, but the one they talk about all the time. And you don't talk about the other ones, they just tell you about cesium and iodine, basically. Sometimes they'll mention strontium. There's a hundred times more strontium for every cesium that you see. Hi, Stetson. Navtil. Thank you, Navtil. Anybody? Amthurst. Solar Mechanic. Stetson. And so the Expedition for Life... Solar's in the house, Sylvia. I never get everybody, and I always feel bad. Jester, just make sure it grows me. Yeah, you guys are kicking ass. And so, this expedition for life, uh, we raised over $4,000 and once again, you know, 
I believe I'm going to need another 2,000 before this trip is out to finish out the 10 days up north and get back. That's providing we don't have any issues. That's providing nothing goes wrong. <laughs> and so I'm always risking everything every time. I'm always putting everything on the line every time. And like I still haven't had a break now in 9, 10 months. There is no break. I'm not capable of it. And that's okay, I guess. Right? That's just the way I am. And so we go get this data and get, get the next trip and get the rest of the data. I'm going to be um, extremely happy at that stage that now we can, we can do that documentary in style. And at the same time, you know, this time going up, we got to get into the community with the cameras. I'm more mobile now than what I was before. And it's summertime. There's going to be a lot of people approaching us. Got a lot of experience at this right now. You know, during the winter when I was up there, it was raining all the time and blowing and freezing. It's winter. It's impossible to find someone to do an interview. And you got to protect your cameras from the water on top of that. And so you're not lugging it around in, in miserable winter weather when you're ashore. And when I was going ashore, it was always repairing and fixing things and replacing things and trying to get the basics to head back out with and raising enough money to keep it afloat. This time going up is summertime. People are in a better mood. It's very hot. People are wearing their shorts and t-shirts and they're traveling all over the coastline and they're asking questions. I'm going to have that camera going all the time. And so, I mean, you know, we still got to do the presentations in those communities up north before the summer's out. So that's going to take a couple of weeks. I got to organize that. And so, like, I got high hopes to do all of this. I really must, you know, because I, it just seems insurmountable, insurmountable and impossible every time I try to do something, but yet we go ahead and we get it done. I don't know. We just keep going till it's done, I suppose. But even when I'm doing these live streams, they seem insurmountable to me all the time. You know, I was sitting here at night and I just, I passed out and I woke up and I said, okay, I'll do a live stream. But... By the time I iron my shirt and clean, washed and comb my hair and blah, 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 and got a cup of tea and everything else and sat down here. It wasn't until I finally sat here and got everything imported and ready to go that I said, okay, well, I'll probably feel better. And I do. Because I know how important it is to come out and have these conversations, to have this, this uh, venue for people on top of that. And for myself, just for my own. Uh, you know, I have to be able to come out and talk. I have to be come out. And this is our legacy of showing that documentation and now coming back and going through it all again. Record number of six seals and sea lions because they're mostly dependent upon the krill to feed the creatures and the phytoplankton to fill those creatures. And that's the ones that were highly affected. But, I mean, they, they ran articles. I'll come back and touch on that in a minute. Researchers predict the West Coast killer whales will exceed 1,000 becquerels a kilogram. 50 beckles, a kilo, 50 beckles a kilogram means permanent lesion on your organs and permanent lesion on your heart. Yeah? And so what's a thousand beckles a kilogram going to do to the whales? Well, their body is flooded with white blood cells, same as ours, and they're going to fight the radiation. So the whales have less oxygen. And so the big, deep diving mammals, you'll start seeing them staying shallower because they don't they can't retain the oxygen to go deep anymore and but they'll find less oxygen down deep because the oxygen is produced at the surface right and you know the phytoplankton converts it into energy and then the krill converts that into energy and then the fish are the energy that we consume and other animals and birds and predators consume uh, but you're wiping it out. And so the only krill basically that's going to be left out there is stuff that's pre-Fukushima. Krill can live up to 10 years. And so that's why we're seeing the mass die off because the krill's not reproducing. That's the food for the larvae and the small fries and the bird population uh, for throughout the entire ocean, right? And so all the micro filter feeders and stuff like that are dependent upon that soup of life of eggs and larvae that floats through the ocean and the nutrients associated with that and protein and everything else. Uh, over 10 times government living in Japan. Government in Japan is mass murderers. They just keep increasing the levels. 
that's not what they got the job to do. They, they, they were hired by the Japanese people. A government, and a government employee is just someone you put there to do a job for you. So when you hear a government employee done this or a government done that, that's your employees fucking you. That's your employees stabbing you to death. That's your employees running over you and your loved ones and leaving you on the side of the road bleeding and dying. That's your government doing that to you. All of this is your government doing it to you. All, your go all of this is your government. You put there as an oversight to these corporations, right? And you this is your government taking fistfuls of cash so there's no oversight. These are the people you hired. Every one of them fucked you over. Every one of them are stabbing you to death. Every one of them are looting everything you got there. You don't have a government anymore. You have a mob. You have a gang. You have... Um, you have like goblins in control. You have these these creepy creatures running your system. You have these creepy creatures, these misfits, these rejects uh, that are migrated into positions of power just to be more evil, to, to have more control. And then willingly, willingly sold you, willingly hit it all away because they could never get another job at anything. The only job they could ever get and keep is a government job because you can't get fired from a government job, right? You're part of the brotherhood of, of the thieves and lawyers and idiots and morons. Only a moron and an idiot would go to work for the government, you know, and gullible people. And I'm not saying everybody that's working for it don't at some point wake up and realize it, but how do you get away from it when everybody that you work with is stealing Everybody you work with is just lazy, stupid fucks. Everybody's there because they're inbreeds of other government inbreeds. Between the inbreeding, right? You know, the, it's this system that is disgusting. And so in one sense, an extinction event will get rid of that. But unfortunately, it gets rid of the other 8 million species on the planet and all the good people on the planet. And in one sense, it gets rid of this system this antiquated dinosaur system is going to just fall on its own because it done it to itself. Because, And I know that's a sad thing to say, Dana. It's like, Dana, you're condoning the radiation fallout, killing the whole planet just to get rid of those particular people. Well, they would kill you anyway. They would create a nuclear war or something. They'd find another way to kill you. they got thousands of bio labs. You just need a, them doing something stupid when a... When a storm comes through or an accident or there's an explosion, you release it and wipe out the planet anyway. But, like, nuclear is the worst one because it wipes out every species. There's nothing on the planet that has ever encountered it before. So let me keep going here because I'll just start talking about nonsense. The Expedition for Life. Radioactive particles arrived far earlier than predicted. And the plume stretched 48 miles across the ocean. It's not that... Like, don't think of the plume as like a tennis ball. And that tennis ball ended up at 4,800 miles. 4,800 miles away from Japan. Think about that 48 miles, 4,800 miles behind it is all tennis balls. There's no ocean to be seen. It's all tennis balls. So it's all tennis balls coming at us. Okay, that's pretty fucking stupid. They're buckyballs, and they ingest, which is a phenomenon for spraying the salt water in the reactors, and they ingest the atoms, the elements, and to become little nuclear engines. We're going to call them buckyballs. So imagine if they're, look, you know, they were just, you could visually see them, your entire ocean would be covered in it. Your entire country would be covered in it. Everywhere, when you went out to the door and you try to drive down the road, be driving over all these, these tennis balls, buckyballs, right, if you were to scale them up. If you were to scale them up to where you could physically see them, and they still would cover the entire planet. But they would be really high now. And so, but then you'd be looking around and it would be all uh, tennis balls falling out of the sky. You wouldn't be able to see each other. You wouldn't see, I couldn't see my hand because the tennis balls would be falling. So many falling, I wouldn't be able to see it. That's what's going on in our environment. It's a perpetual hemorrhaging into our environment from Fukushima. Because the melted reactors, see, Chernobyl was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. How come? Dana? Well, because it's cannibalizing everything around it, and they're full of atoms. So it atomizes and aerosols 
those atoms and ionizes and radiates those atoms. And now they're dangerous atoms to all life on the planet. There is no nothing on the planet, nothing on the planet, that can live in harmony with it. And there's nothing on the planet, there is no cure on the planet for it. There are ways to deal with it, and that's um, organics, because you don't got no choice, and it's going to have radiation in it, but the GMO got no nutrients in it, but it's going to have the radiation in it. And so it's better to eat the organic with the radiation in it, and the water, you want to drink spring water, mountain water, it's going to have radiation in it, and so is any other water you're going to touch, but that is going to have you know, that's, got, that's not going to be polluted by chemicals and it's in sync with your body. It's, it's, it's commonly known as what they call structured water. And there's a lot of disinformation out there about structured water. And all structured water is water that ran over the mountains and, and their molecules are back to what they are. So if you were to go take out a glacier and dig into a glacier and go back 100,000 years in the glacier and melt down that water... That's what I call structured water. It's not, it has a certain structure. Now, if you added some chemical to it, it would change the molecules. It would realign themselves. And that's what I call unstructured water. And that's a phenomenon that scientists are well aware of, that you changed the water. And like after nuclear tests up to 2,000 miles away, water would change its structure, become highly agitated. And very excited for a long extended period for months at a time. And so that was a phenomenon noticed in many countries after detonations. Was water up to 2,000 miles away freaked out. Of course, you know, the ocean water and a glass of ocean seawater, a drinking glass, a glass, a glass of ocean water would have 75 to 100 million phytoplankton. The bases of the food chain, the oxygen chain, the carbon sequestering chain. The biggest carbon sequester, CO2 sequester on the planet is phytoplankton. The biggest one. So that's why CO2, they, they pumped that out there saying we got to sequester the CO2 because they knew they were killing the, the biggest sequester out there with all the radiation they were already putting into the ocean from all the other nuclear power plants from all the dumping, from all the testing, from all the expunging of the countries, getting rid of their waste, right? So they all said, oh no, we're going to create sarcophagus and put all the nuclear waste in it if you let us have nuclear. And the communities were like, okay. And so then everybody went back to sleep. And what they done was threw it all in the ocean every chance they got and buried it in the local dumps. That's your government allowed them to do it. Your government didn't chase them down and prosecute them. No one gets prosecuted. You can't get a criminal record because they're corporations with human rights through an amendment to the slavery laws, an illegal amendment. And so you, you can't be held accountable. You can, though. Like they, they, they're a corporation. All you can do is get a fine. They can't get a criminal record. Google can't get a criminal record. Google can't go to jail for doing something. They can get a fine. And they keep doing it somewhere else. They learn how to hide it. OSHA can't even, right, Occupational Health and Safety can't even go in there and surprise and inspect them because they have human rights. They piggyback off the slavery laws, right? The slavery laws were uh, mongrelized in increments over decades to give corporations, corporate personhood, the human rights. And so that, that is our biggest problem right now is corporations have human rights and so there's no checks and balances, no one to hold them accountable. No one can go to jail. Tepco can do whatever they want. Nobody can be held accountable. You can't hold an entire corporation and all of its employees accountable. You can only give them a fine. And Tepco's got fines. Hang on one second. Hang on one second. Dana. Surprise. Yeah, Dana. <coughs> Hi, Zoe. So the plume stretched. Look, the o and I'll end on that one there. The, the ocean current at 40, at 4 or 5 miles an hour is going to cross the ocean in 45 days, not in 3 years. 24 hours at 5 miles an hour. 
Multiply it then by 45 days and you're across the ocean. Every day behind it was another plume. And so these plumes, think about how a snowstorm works. You can see a snowstorm is falling down in front of you. Think about each dot, each snow, think about if each snowflake is pulsing 200,000 kilometers an hour. See out to here. And so the snowflakes are this close, but they're able to pulse that far. Or they're able to pulse this far, but they're that close. And so they overlap each other. And when that goes down into the ocean, it's still overlapping each other and still pulsing every second forever. And so that fries all the microorganisms and that fries the billion creatures, right, as it's going past it, because it has it in this, this uh, electron, this like force field that everything, just when the snow hits the ocean, the atom is liberated. And if it does sink, even though... It's, you know, you got to think about how big the atom is. You can put two million of a hit of a needle. And you can't see it, but that's two million cancers if they're ionized and radiated. Right? You know, let me see. That's a guitar pick. Right? And, you, you know, if I can put two million atoms on the head of a needle and not see it, how many atoms is in that guitar pick? Now, if I ionize and radiated every one of the, if I turn that into atoms, and then was able to distribute the atoms out, I could easily kill everybody in Canada in 20 or 30 years' time by giving them one atom each that was ionized and radiated through a chain reaction. It takes a long time for that type of cancer to catch up to you. But what happens, you know, what happens when it's coming at you and that it's um, one million beckles a meter coming through the air? So what happens when your entire ear mass is radiation, is what I'm trying to say to you, is an invisible snowstorm. Just because it's invisible, does that mean that uh, we shouldn't have these conversations? Does that mean that we can't figure out what, it, what, it's, gonna, what it's doing or what it's going to do? Because you can't see it? No, of course not. You know that when a, when a tornado strikes a building... You don't have to be there to verify the building is going to get damaged if it's a direct hit. Because, you know, the tornado is going to damage the building, right? That's just the way it is. Tornadoes, they damage buildings. And they rip them apart and stuff like that. And so when you're, if someone calls you up and says, uh, my house just, a friend of yours calls you up and says, hey, listen, can I come stay with you a couple of days? I just got hit, my house just got hit by a tornado. Do you, like, is your first vision... Oh, they want, they got to get Molly made in there and dust the house? Or is it they got to get a construction crew come in and try to repair the building, right? Well, your thought is going to be they're going to have to get a construction crew coming in. They're not going to say, do you want me to come over and help you clean up? No, they ask you, could they come stay at your house because it was destroyed? See, you know that intuitively because they said they were going to get struck with a tornado. And you know that if you have a snowstorm every day, all day for four years? Just think about that one. You're going to have a lot of snow, and you're not going to be wearing sneakers anywhere, and you're going to have to get gloves and a scarf, right? But what about if you have an invisible snowstorm all day, every day for four years? See, these are things that we said we would have to postulate if we had a nuclear war. Uh, say, you know, if America and Russia went to war, and don't get me started, because you always got to have a boogeyman. So America is the Russian's boogeyman, and Russia is the American's boogeyman. And for 50 years, that's all we've heard. We've wrecked this planet with that, so that the military can get money, can use fear to intimidate you and grow so big and so uncontrollable that now they get 53 cents on every dollar, and then now they have to cannibalize you. I mean, 10,000 Taliban... 20 uh, odd thousand drone strikes to get 10,000 Taliban, 5 million orphans, million dead, millions missing, millions in refugee camps, entire countries destroyed to get 10,000 people. Right? That's how powerful that system is. It tricked you into that and made you buy into that. You know, uh, 280,000 rapes in the military, if they're raping their own that many in that period, in a decade, how many did they rape in Afghanistan and Iraq? Millions, right? And I mean, 22 veterans committing suicide every day. That's 80,000 suicides. 
but only over 4,700 died in the war, but 80,000 suicides, 300,000 rapes of their own, million dead to get 10,000 people, all of that to get 10,000 people, 53 cents on every dollar to get 10,000 gangbangers, 10,000 people that were created and funded by the CIA. And so they sold nuclear to you through the same strong arm tactics where the media come out and they act as attack dogs and, a, and just a smut machine, a smear machine. It's a smear machine. Each community's media is nothing better than a smut machine, a snuff movie. That's all these things are. They're snuff movies. That's, that's what they do. They make snuff movies. They kill things so you don't find out what, what else they're up to. Right? And, and it's all conjectures. It's all just opinions. That's all media is. If you want a real one, you go read the academic studies. But there's 4,300 of them produced every day. But you can't because they're locked away behind the paywalls of Elsewhere, Springer, and Wiley. <clears throat> and high broken ass all nerd. Number 27. Thumbs up, I take it. Hi, Jerry. Gary. Miller. Brady Youngie. Mr. Arenas. Come in and say hi. Just in case I missed anybody. Hi, Chris Hagen. TPP just passed. And LA, the age of unaccountability. Solar, Missy Sky, and Kate is out there. Answers. Yeah, you're welcome, Miss Milky. So we'll wind it down. Say good night to everybody. 8.57. We, hit, we almost hit the whole hour. My savers don't have 7,000 chemicals. I'm using a true Canadian blend. They got filters. They make the particles smaller. Get through the liners of your lungs. Hi, Losa TV. Thank you again. Adam, wannabe, Miss Milky, Mr. Renus, Mindy, wannabe, Missing Sky, Bruce Me. I oh, hang on, say goodnight to a few people as you show up there. And we'll talk, um, let me come back over to this other one. So a million Beck walls a square meter, the size of your kitchen table, throughout the entire country, raining down on you. That's what I was talking about with that headline. That's what I was talking about when I was explaining to you about the snow. That's what I was talking about. And we'll end the night on... Hi, Lizard. Leads to the bad guys. And the normal people are brainwashed. Good night, Kate. Hugs, Kate. Thank you, honey. Now, I'm going to try to be leaving on Saturday, if the weather's permitting. Not looking good for Saturday and Sunday. And so if I don't go, we'll do another stream, hopefully. And I got a lot of stupid amount of work to do before I take off. And if I still don't raise the rest of the money before I take off, then the last video, I'll, I'll put out a very strong video to raise the rest of it. And so you need to raise another 1800 and I'll feel safer. I still got to spend more money tomorrow. I got to spend money at the welders tomorrow. We spent 950 on equipment already. And we got to spend probably another five or 600. Hopefully no more than that. And then fuel up groceries and, and expendables. And then head up the coastline when the weather breaks. Or we'll move it all up by trailer and launch from the top of Vancouver Island, one or the other. I'm hoping just to drive right out of here this trip. And so, good night, everybody. Once again, uh, you can. And uh, Malco, Chan again. Want to be. Good night, everybody. And once again, you know. What we're doing is the moral thing. What we're doing is the ethical thing. What we're doing is. We already got a system out there that's supposed to go do this. And what they done was they hid it away from you. They lied to you and told it was like a banana potato chip walking in sunshine. Uh, dental x-rays, you turn them on, you turn them off. 
getting on an airplane. None of that stuff was real. And so they can't tell you the truth. And that's why we exist. And once again, Miss Milky just put out a wonderful video. And Missy Scott, there's all kinds of links down below if you're watching this later and you're looking for other things and other people and other takes on this. There's all kinds of data. You just got to learn where it's to and how to find it. And have an open mind and do some research yourself when you get an opportunity. We'll get one more stream out hopefully before I take off. Um, I'm sure we'll get one more out. So we'll talk to everybody soon. Once again, hugs for everybody. Dana does love you. I do appreciate everything you're doing for everything on this planet. You're doing it for this planet. You're doing it for yourselves, you're doing it for this entire planet. And ultimately, what we, we're doing is going to make the difference. If there is to be a difference made, we are going to be the catalyst for that. And I truly believe that. We are already done that in many ways. And so, hugs for everybody.